say welcome to everybody. We're really glad that you're with us here today. My name is Elizabeth McMunn-Tetenko, and I'm a librarian here at UC Merced. And I'm pleased to be able to introduce Dr. Zhao Yi Lu, who's going to be giving our library faculty author series talk today. The faculty author series showcases the latest research and scholarship by UC Merced faculty members. And if you would like to be featured in a future faculty author series talk, please let me know. Or if you know someone you think should be featured in a future faculty author series talk, please let me know too. Um, for today, we're thrilled to have Dr. Liu here with us. Dr. Liu is an assistant professor in the Department of Computer Science and Engineering here at UC Merced. He's also the founder and director of Parallel and Distributed Systems Laboratory, PADSYS Lab. Dr. Liu is widely published and has contributed over 100 papers to international conferences, workshops, and journals, and has given talks, tutorials, and presentations around the world. His research interests include parallel and distributed computing, high-performance interconnects, advanced I.O. technologies, big data analytics, virtualization, cloud computing, and deep learning system software. And we're so happy to have him here with us today. So I am going to turn this over now to Dr. Liu. I'll stop my share. Okay, thank you so much for the introduction. Let me open my, uh, share my screen. Uh, okay. So uh, can you see it now? Can you see I can my see it, yeah. Okay, okay, nice. Uh, okay, I'm present. What, what, what is the uh, screen you are seeing? This is the present, present is it, showing up, right? Yeah, so I see it looks like the first, um, the first slide is showing up. Okay, okay, thank you so much. Okay, then let me get started. Uh, uh, nice introduction. So you can call me Xiaoyi. <laughs> That's like uh, hopefully is is easy to pronounce it. So uh, this is my first time to to present. Even though I, I present the talks, most of them are technical talks. So this is first time to discuss a book. So actually, I consult with uh, uh, Elizabeth to to come up with a uh, you know flow of the talk. So it's a little bit different than my usual talks. So hopefully. Uh, it will go smoothly, okay. <laughs> but otherwise, feel free to stop, stop me and uh, and uh, and uh, check with me if you have any questions, okay. So the book is about high performance speaker computing. Uh, so this book uh, uh, is already available, so you can you can uh, get it from Amazon or some other uh, sellers. Okay, so this is the. Yeah, so the outline I discussed with it is obviously is a little is like this is a little bit long, but uh, I'm hoping that uh, through this talk you can know more about me, my my research and my group as well as uh, what's going on in this field and uh, what kind of uh, research are being done in recent years for to handle this type of big data challenges and uh, uh, what we did what we wrote in the book and the uh, story about the book. So hopefully this may help, help may be helpful for some of the uh, faculty members in the future if you want to write a book. And then uh, also acknowledgement to some of the people who helped me in the past. So brief, briefly int uh, introduce uh, the history of the Pandasys Lab. Uh, you know, uh, things, this was created in uh, September 2018 uh, at the Ohio State University. But actually, before that, I was a, a core member and the research scientist in Now Lab at Ohio State University, and then later I, I, I was promoted to, fact, to to be a faculty member in the department. And then, you know, uh, it has to be independent researcher, so that's why I created the Pathesis Lab. And then the the top picture you can see over here is actually uh, the photo was taken at OSU before, just right before the COVID uh, break. So um, some of the students actually still. Some of them graduated, but some of them are uh, still uh, working towards to their uh, PhD degree uh, at Ohio State University. For instance, um, Frank and uh, Yu Jie are here, I think. Uh, Frank, are you, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Okay. Would you like to just quickly introduce yourself? <laughs> so that, uh, uh, yeah. So, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Frank Lee. I'm from China. I'm a uh, Currently a third year PhD student at Ohio University. Uh, so I previously I worked with uh, with Xiaoyi um, in Ohio State University and uh, our 
main research focus is on HPC and uh, RDMA. Um, we had collaborated to produce, I mean, to, to work on many projects and papers. So it was like an uh, exciting time and um, really rewarding to work with him. Okay. Yeah. Thank, thank you so much. And then another student, uh, Yujie, are you there? Yeah, hi, Xiaoyan, I'm here. Yeah, yeah, yeah you can yeah, just, just quickly uh, introduce yeah, yeah. yourself. Yeah, hi, I'm Yujie, and I'm a fourth year PhD, uh, PhD student in OSU. And uh, yeah, I'm, I have much experience working with Ch uh, Professor Xiaoyi. And uh, yes, I'm glad to have like papers and working with Xiaoyi. And uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, so then, uh, you, you know, things, since January 2021, I, I joined the user Uh it's, it's a new journey for me, and, and also it's a new journey for Panasys Lab. So, and over here, my, my group is growing. You can see uh, this picture, the, the bottom one, actually the picture was taken just a, a few weeks back. It's online still. Hopefully we can uh, hold our group meeting uh, in the SE2 building very soon in the future. So you can see we have multiple students over here as well, so maybe, uh, also, I will let them just introduce themselves quickly, okay? Aiden, can you do it quickly also, please? Yeah. So I'm a, I'm a new PhD student in the PADSYS lab. Um, my interests are mainly, I guess, just in systems generally, and also applications of computer science and remote sensing. Okay, thank you. Liu Yao? Hi, my name is Liu Yao, uh, a first year PhD student in PADSYS lab at UCM. And my research interests include the co-design of software, software and hardware. Thank you. Hey, Darren? Hello, uh, I'm Darren. Uh, I'm a first year master's student. And my research interests are deep learning, uh, storage, and cloud computing. Thank you. Yuke? Uh, hi, this is Yuke. Uh, I'm the second year PhD student uh, at uh, UC Merced Passes Lab. Uh, and uh, recently I'm working on the RDMA and MPR related project. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Hao? Hello, everyone. My name is Hao, and I am a first year master student in the Palace Lab. And I personally know Professor Lu since when he was still in OSU, and it has been great to work with him. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Arjun. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Arjun. And I'm a third year PhD student at the Patsys Lab at uh, UC Merced. And uh, I was also working with Professor Lu since Ohio State University and moved uh, to Merced along with him. And my research interests are in storage systems and cloud computing. Thank you Thank so you. much. Thank you so much. Okay. So I think uh, I think to the audience, right? So based on the theory introduction, I believe you know that uh, okay, what 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 kind of background my team has and what kind of research topic we're probably uh, working uh, currently. So I just give a quick summary over here so that you know, it may be uh, even clear. So basically uh, in my team or in my group, we do HPC based research. HPC basically means high performance computing. We do systems level or library levels research. And also we do high performance bigger than AI. That's actually one of the focus of this book. And the hot networking technologies, scalable memory systems, cloud computing virtualization, and also we do some kind of collaborations with different uh, people from uh, other uh, domains. This is also one of the purpose today. I hope that uh, I can find some collaborator collaborators as well. Uh, so just for some of you's uh, information, right? If you are not in this area, like uh, high performance computing is very uh, it kind of like uh, enabling technologies that you can use it to build very fast, scalable kind of systems, libraries, applications for your uh, particular um, application uh, problems, right? So I'll give some examples later as well. So for instance, uh, here I give some examples, like uh, particularly in my group, we did a lot of work uh, for the message passing interface runtime, like MTI. I think if you, if you, if you guys have the experience with uh, HPC, you can see that almost all HPC uh, applications uh, if they want to do parallel uh, executions, then most of them actually written with MPI programming language or programming model. And then in the meantime, uh, because MPI, you have to like support fault tolerance so that we, my group also do something for supporting the checkpoint restart so that if your application is crashed, then uh, we can automatically uh, restart your execution uh, on some other uh, nodes so that it, 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 you, don't, you don't have to be worry about the uh, crashes or errors in your programs. And then the, another 
program model we are we are working on currently is uh, called PGAS. This is a little bit different than MPI, which is like a similar to a distribution memory concept, but uh, a little bit different than that. So this uh, one of the example we show here is called Open Shaman. Okay, it's kind of you can access different. Uh, uh, you can access the memory from different nodes and with your program runtime support. And hybrid MPI plus X program models, like you can use MPI plus uh, PGS or MPI plus something else. And then, uh, you know, like, like I said earlier, so because of the expertise or experience we have in HPC area, we are trying to like uh, borrow some ideas or technologies from HPC area and then try to uh, incorporate them into a new exciting field. Sometimes people call it big data or data intensive computing or uh, data-driven uh, 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 data driven or data-centric uh, or data-intensive computing, something like that, okay? But anyway, uh, you know, right? So many many existing applications actually uh, heavily rely on a lot of data to, to uh, get a new insights for the science, right? For instance, AI is one of the good examples, right? But this field is very big. So I, I will just, I will introduce this one in a, in, in, in a, with a lot of slides later. So I will skip this one for now. And the hot network technologies, this is something uh, we, we uh, my group actually uh, work on for many years. So for instance, we did a lot of work with uh, RDMA. I will introduce this one, this technology later as well, Infinity Band, Rocky, GPU Direct, RDMA, Network Computing, SmartNix, Program Switch, some, something like that. Here's just one example, like uh, how we are how we are able to like uh, use Smartnik and the GPU, CPU kind of things to build reliable storage systems. So we call it twin easy. Basically, means if you have data, you 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 worry about whether the device will be uh, will have some crashes or some of your disks may have problems. You may lose your data. There's one technique called the UHF coding, so that uh, you can help you to play the data. Okay, but we in our group we did a lot of work trying to uh, improve the efficiency of these uh, reliability te technologies. And then similarly uh, for other direction like a memory systems, uh, you know, the, the, today, right? It's so a lot of data needs to be stored in storage or in hybrid memory systems, including DRAM, uh, persistent memory or NVMe based SSDs. Well, we have some open source projects for that so that, uh, you know, can help you to improve and protect your data in memory. Uh, and then cloud and edge computing, uh, we we my team also has expertise on this domain, so that we you, we can help you to achieve near native performance on virtual machines or container based virtualization environment, and help you to do live migration over different nodes. And then uh, we did a lot of work to help to build to help the community build the next generation HPC cloud. And recently, we're also trying to move to the new domain called edge computing. So, for instance. We are trying to uh, help uh, researchers to, to, to achieve high performance edge AI processing solutions on top of some uh, upcoming edge devices, just like a Google TPU or like NVIDIA and Xiaomi kind of uh, uh, devices. So, and something, this is like a very, very much focused on the HPC or focused on system area, but uh, of course, we also work with some uh, application scientists so that we can do uh, interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary collaborations kind of researches. For instance, I'll give some examples like real-time pharma data, data analytics, group testing for COVID, brain clinic uh, clinic analysis, mommy nuts detection analysis, something like that. But of course, we always welcome more collaboration from different uh, uh, domains and uh, with different backgrounds. Feel free to talk with me if you have some interest after uh, listening to my talk. Okay, so that's a quick overview and a quick introduction to, uh, to the to all of you about my team and uh, what 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 we're doing the, uh, in the in the group and uh, and the, we are we are hoping that uh, you know uh, you can find something uh, you probably uh, can work with us. Feel free to reach out to us. Okay, and then let's 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 now go to the uh, major focus of today's talk. And we are trying to discuss what is big data and uh, how, what kind of big data applications are there today and why this is a big problem and this is a big challenge. So as you can see that uh, big data has changed the way people understand uh, and uh, harness the power of data and not on, including not only uh, business domain as well as the in, in our scientific computing domain, right? So some of these uh, figures show the different applications in different areas. So some of them, like let's say from Facebook, some of them from uh, uh, some research 
teams, they are trying to uh, solve different kinds of problems, but all of them trying to, trying to uh, handle or try to analyze this, uh, a big amount of data. So sometimes uh, we also call the high performance data analysis like HPDA workloads in the cloud or in the HPC infrastructures. So typically, um, people use different ways to describe big data uh, problems or big data, big data issues. For instance, they use large volume to describe that how many how large data you have in your in your uh, application, right? So that's uh, like a data unrest. And then also some for some application, your data is actually moving uh, in every in every seconds, right? So but just like a streaming processing, you have some camera, and then that camera take take videos, and the videos need immediately processed so that they can detect some uh, uh, weird uh, behavior or something like that. And then you can warning, and then the warning will trigger some kind of actions automatically. So those like a data in motion. And then data with different formats or forms is like a core, sometimes called a variety. So it's like, a, you know, your, your data actually sometimes uh, stored in structured database or sometimes stored in file system or some cloud storage, like unstructured data, right? For instance, you have some video, music, files, those are all unstructured data. But how to like mine values or get values over it is a big problem as well. And then also sometimes you have to make sure whether your data is integrated and consistent, something like that. That's also a big problem we have to solve in the big data uh, domains. So this is a nice picture to show that why big data becomes so a uh, big problem in the industry like uh, the core data never sleeps. So this is a very good example to show that uh, how many, how much uh, data actually is generated every minute in the internet services, right? So for instance, you can see that Google actually, for Google, right, it conducts 5.7 million search per minute. Maybe you say, okay, it's just a one search or some search, right? But actually this 5.7 million search, you can think each request it may take several bytes or maybe k, k, uh, k kilobytes right and then and then over there they were generated logs in the in the data center uh, services and then the, those logs will trigger some other backend uh, processing and then those systems will, will, will generate the logs again or generate data again so actually every minute you actually generate a lot of data uh, in in all these services okay like a twitter instagram and blah 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 so uh, more requests, and then we'll 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 lead to bigger data sizes, and then bigger data sizes will trigger complex algorithms to be developed in applications. So this this is why we see uh, big data is a big challenge in the community in different kind of communities, not just us. So here, just give you some examples. In uh, if you zoom in these, to these figures, right? For, for instance, what kind of applications we are using every day so that you can generate data uh, for the for uh, in the from in the internet services, right? For instance, this this like a caption generation, translation, style transfer, something like that. So uh, this basically, you can think. I believe we are we actually use this kind of uh, tools or apps in our cell phone or every day or most right. If you go to some new countries, you don't you don't understand the language, then you can use your uh, uh, real time translation tool or app to translate language from uh, uh, from uh, like let's say. Uh, if you don't understand Chinese, right, you can translate from Chinese to English, something like that, okay? And then this is a quick uh, demo to show how your, you can use Google Translate to uh, easily uh, real-time translate whatever language from uh, one to the other, to, to another. And then uh, these days, right, Tesla or other self-driving cars are very popular. So uh, internally, you can think this is just like a computer on with four wheels, right? So uh, internally, it's very powerful computers, if actually, right? Uh, they, they need to real-time analysis what kind of objects in front of the car so that you won't hit any, anything, right? That's a very uh, important. So you cannot uh, lose even 1% of accuracy, right? That's, that will cause a big problems for, your, for the uh, cars. But actually, not only in uh, internet services, uh, big data problems, are, like I said earlier, actually is also there in uh, scientific domains. For instance, if you want to do scientific data management analysis for visualization, that's sometimes that image is too huge. You cannot even load it to your memory. And then you have to like uh, 
uh, tile them and then and then process them and then you can show that. That's actually also very common in scientific domains. So many of them actually need to run large scale simulations on supercomputers and then dump data to the parallel storages and then connect them and then run experiments on top of it and then finally fertilize the results. That's the usual steps in scientific computing domain. But all these steps need to uh, handle the bigger challenges to some extent. Another interesting trend, like I said earlier, so like uh, uh, data centric or data driven uh, deep learning applications. Okay, so for instance, this is one of the examples actually I borrowed from SE 2018. This is a Golden Bear Prize winner. So they are trying to use supercomputers to uh, train uh, uh, a huge model to predict uh, uh, climate cli climate changing problems. Okay, they are they have used more than 27,000 GPUs. They achieved 1.13 exaflops peak performance for floating point 16 operations. This is a over 4,560 nodes. This is a really big HPC application, HPC designs for uh, deep learning or data-driven deep learning applications. The very, very challenging problem. That's why they can get this award, okay? Okay, this is the award. Uh, up to here, these are all the examples uh, I borrowed from internet or from uh, some papers or some other, other teams work. In my team, we actually also collaboration. Like I said earlier, we, we do collaboration with different people from different background. Uh, I'm, going, I'm trying to show some examples in uh, what we did in our team, okay? So this is one actually is collaboration work with Case Western, uh, Case Western Reserve University. Uh, I think the first author actually also here. Uh, ben, are you there? Oh, yes. Okay, yeah. So Ben is actually the the, the first author of this paper. Uh, he did a lot of work to uh, to achieve this real time FRMI data analytics goal. And uh, the basic idea is that maybe I'm, if I'm wrong, Ben, please, uh, or or if you, if you if I miss anything, please add add it. Free, uh, feel free to add it. Okay. So basically, what we're trying to show here is that if you have a you have a some if you want to do some FRMI scanning on your brain or or something like that. And then typically you have a scanner computer which directly control this uh, scanner, right? And then you will get this image data immediately. But you know, right, these days if you go to hospitals, typically the doctor will say, okay, give us one day or, or several days, I'll give you the results, right? But sometimes, you know, uh, mm, that's not uh, efficient. Uh, if you from the, if you from, uh, if you think from uh, like a dizzy diagnosis perspective. So sometimes, um, uh, you have to like put some, give some kind of like uh, uh, stimulus to the to the to the to the patient, and then trying to take some more images, and then those more images needs to processed in the real time manner, so that you know that whether what you did make some effect or not. Okay, but then if this if these things have take one day or two days to do, then it make a lot of big pain for your for the for the patients, right? That's not a, and also you may make a lot of mistakes. So that's why what we did with uh, Ben or kind of his advisor here is that we are trying to build uh, trying to build some uh, system which can help these uh, the doctors to do real time analysis on the fRMI images, and then we can we can quickly like we, less than one seconds per scan, we can we can tell the doctors what happened and whether you should stop or should continue to to do the tests. So uh, this the this the this the if you look at this picture, this is the flow. So for instance, every time you get the scan the image, and then we have this, what we did in this data server, we try to process it. But this data server actually is in the hospital. So it's like an Indo firewall, right? So it's more highly protected. But then if something, if but in the hospital, typically you don't have enough CPU or GPU power, right? So then sometimes we have to borrow some kind of trusted computing cluster in HPC center or even in the cloud, and then we can do some kind of data synchronization and then computing the results back and then send back to this controller and then control this FRMI uh, in instrument. All these things has to be done within one second. So this is a really big challenge, okay? Especially uh, we, we envision that in next generation FRMI scanner, this will be even harder because, you know, the, the resolution we are always increasing, right? If the resolution get increased, then this problem becomes even harder. But you only have one second or or several seconds to finish all the jobs. So this is a big, big problem. Uh, we are we are still working on this one. Uh, we hope our paper will get published soon. But hopefully, uh, this will be helpful for the human society. Anything uh, you want to add, Ben? 
<laughs> okay, thank you. Yeah, so this is another work also did by Ben. So <laughs> Ben is a great PhD student in the, in the case Western, okay? So what we did is, you know, because of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, right? What I, uh, his advisor has a, has a come, came up with the idea that because we have to use a lot of test kits to test uh, each potential uh, uh, patient individually, right? That will actually waste a lot of time and a lot of resources. Then we are thinking whether we can do some kind of group testing for a group of people, right? You, you know, right? If, you, if a group of people, they are all negative, then the results should be negative. But if one of them or several of them actually active, then your results should be active, right? That's basically the idea of group testing. However, there's a big challenge with group testing. One of them is called dilution effects, right? So for instance, you have a lot of group samples, then, then probably let's say you have, you have more than 20 samples, but if only one of them uh, is kind of like uh, infected, then, and also in early stage, then you cannot, you cannot effectively detect the, the, the virus actually, you know, then the, actually that will cause the uh, false negative problems, right? Uh, and also not only that, you know, uh, if you want to do those kind of testing, that take a lot of time, a lot of manpower resources, actually, you know, there were been a lot of, you, you know, you, you, during the peak of the pandemic time, right? That's a big challenge. So what we did with Ben uh, and his group and, uh, and his advisor is that we are trying to propose a precise Bayesian group testing method to help not only on accuracy, but also on the scalability and the performance. So you can, I don't want to go to details, but if you look at this figure, you can see that compared with the ideal case, we our solution is almost linear scalable or very close to the ideal case. Okay, we are actually have a paper just just got accepted in high PC conferences. Uh, we have multiple follow up papers to try to improve this work again. So we are going to publish them soon as well. So this actually uh, or with with everything we did, we are able to like uh, uh, speed up the problem solution by up to one thousand seven hundred thirty three times. Okay, if you don't if you don't have uh, incorporate our solutions for one group test, you probably need to spend the, like a uh, days or or hours to finish. But with our solution, I remember uh, finally with thirty uh, subject samples. What's the time, Ben? I forgot. With four K CPU cores. Uh, when uh, subject number is thirty, um, so actually the computation will be uh, billions of times. Uh, so uh, the total time using 4096 cores is 30 minutes. Uh, okay. With the old methods, yeah, it will take probably months. Okay. okay. Thank. Yeah. Thank you. So with 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 what we did over here, we are really help. Uh, I think we really did a great job to help this group testing domain. Okay, that's a that's a fantastic result. Thanks to the collaboration with Ben and his advisor. So that's why I invited him to come here to share these exciting results. So another one, actually, we this also similar to FRMI data analysis, but this is another problem. Like uh, we are trying to analyze is the high, trying to analyze the brain clinical problems. So this problem we actually um, did in multiple years back. This is like the paper was published in 2017. Uh, here they, they have a library, they have a tool called Life. Basically they are trying to use some kind of linear uh, FASCO evaluation method to analyze brain clinical activities in your brain. So actually this brain is actually the, my collaborator, collaborator's brain. He did the FRMI scan of his own brain and then write his paper, <laughs> something like that, okay? So then the, originally, you know, just the process the one brain, you need to take more than five, 4,500 seconds. But then with our method, we are, you see, you can, we can reduce to like a, uh, less than 1,000 or almost just the 600 seconds, something like that. So actually we did this on tax stampy cluster, which is a very, uh, which was a top six or top five supercomputer in the world. And then we are able to, in a single node, we are able to uh, uh, improve like six X performance for this brain image processing. So here we see, we find that actually uh, easy and fast science discovery is the key and the distributed and part of computing uh, expertise or knowledge is, is needed to help you. Okay, those are, are examples or um, applications I did with you, with still we actually oh, oh by the way so this is a collaboration with uh, Indiana University uh, and then and then and then actually I want to share one example this is 
uh, the collaboration I did with our youth research professor. So Professor Reza uh, uh, Sani, I believe some of you may know him. So he's a um, agriculture scientist. So uh, we actually met earlier and then he said, he told me he has a problem called now disease detection. Uh, I believe this is a very unique unique and interesting problem in California, right? So every, every winter, if you go across some uh, almond trees, almond trees, you can see that there's some kind of tiny bore, something like this, okay, in this picture, some tiny nuts actually uh, still there on the tree. That's actually called the mummy nuts, okay? Over there, the, this mummy nuts actually will bring a lot of problems for your food healthy and also influence the, uh, the next year uh, nuts uh, growing, something like that. I, I not fully understand the, 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 the science behind it, but, uh, but this is the problem, okay? For us, uh, for, for growers, right, they must adequately monitor and track now disease to prevent the spreading. If this, spread, if, if this disease spread all over the trees, then it's a big problem for those farmers. So that's why tracking this one and the monitoring this disease is very important for, for California uh, farmers. So we, I collaborate with Professor Reza. We are trying to like detect the uh, mommy nuts with some kind of robot uh, in the future, right? Or with uh, ro uh, robots and then, or drones, something like that. And then we are we can try to analyze this, how serious of this problem in, in, in the farm, okay? But here, of course, the if you look at this picture, you can see a lot of challenges, right? Uh, first of all, you can see there are a lot of complex and, uh, and uh, a lot of noise in these images, right? So, and also this image is very huge sometimes, and uh, it's very hard to, uh, even for human, right? If you look at this picture, it's very hard to say how many mummy nuts actually are over there in the trees, right? So then you can think how, how hard it is for computer programs. So uh, what we did currently is we are, we, first of all, we are trying to create a, a real data sets. We, we collected some data sets uh, with Professor Reza's group and uh, we did some annotations on top of it manually so far. Uh, and we built some benchmarks and then hopefully our benchmarking tool data sets, we will make them publish, public available in the future once this paper gets accepted. And then hopefully these tools and the data sets can help uh, researchers like uh, from agriculture domain and the computer science domain to work together to solve these big problems. Uh, and we are very excited to, uh, about this uh, collaboration, and we hope that in the future we can just, uh, we can bring we can really uh, design some solutions to help our farmers. Okay, those are all real applications. Okay, from not only industry but also scientific domains. Any questions before I continue? Okay. So if you no know questions, let me uh, jump to challenges. Of course, I already mentioned some challenges from, you can think from the application domain perspective, right? But then uh, what's, if you are working on the computer science, right? If you are working like a system researchers like me, then you probably think, okay, how I'm going to help these guys, right? How, how I can easily help them to design their applications from different scenarios, right? Different contexts. So if you look at the industry, right? Industry, this is the picture or this the architecture of data center systems these, these days uh, widely deployed in, in not only big companies, but, uh, but also some research institu institutions. You can think broadly they can divide into two tiers, one called front end tier, the other one called back end tier. So in front end tier, typically you're trying to like uh, solve uh, customer facing problems, right? How, how if their request comes, you have to real, serve their requests in real-time manner and help them get the results accurately, fastly, in a fast manner, as well as uh, scalable, right? But in the back end, you, you have all this data, like I said, you have every, your, all your, all your uh, clicks on the, on, the, on the browser or on your cell phone actually generating data. But then how actually we can mine those data, right? How we can get a value from those data. That's actually rely on back-end tier analytics applications or, or jobs. So over there, actually, they are using totally different uh, uh, program models or, or assistant technology to help our users. For instance, probably some of you heard of MapReduce, right? That was developed by Google. And then Spark, right? This was developed by UC Berkeley. And the TensorFlow, Google again, PyTorch, Facebook, all those frameworks actually very popular. 
But then if you look at the scientific domain, right, actually uh, that's another problem, another scenario and or another challenge we are facing. One is uh, you can think from the middle part, we are trying to develop data intensive computing applications. We have to handle volume, pro large volume problem, velocity problem, binary problem. But unfortunately, when you just stand from application perspective, if you look to the, to the system architecture perspective, you see that, okay, I can borrow some solutions from HPC domain like MPI, PGAS, I mentioned earlier. You can also think whether I should borrow the technology from big data community like Spark, Hadoop, or I borrow some existing solutions from deep learning like TensorFlow or PyTorch or some others, right? MATLAB, something like that. Then running on top of ACC systems like Petascale, Exascale, or post scale systems. Or if you look at to, to the program model perspective, like I mentioned earlier, you can use MPI or MPI plus PGAS, you can Hadoop, Spark, TensorFlow, different kind of like uh, program models available. So which one is the right solution for you? Tell me, right? So that's a big, big that's a that's a like a unknown sometimes for, for many application scientists. For instance, just, just for the example I showed earlier, right? When I talked with Ben's advisor in the beginning, we are we are trying to select whether we should use the MPI or we should use Spark. Right? Because I'm not an application scientist. I don't know exactly how their uh, problem is, right? How their, how their workflow kind of things will work, how kind of things. But, but I know, but I can only understand something uh, I got from Professor Kurt, right? His advisor. And then based on what he told me, I, I suggest something. But, but actually later, after several years collaboration, we see that actually maybe Spark is not the right solution. Or maybe Spark is not the only right solution, okay? We actually find some other solutions currently. Maybe more fit better for, for his application. So this is actually a big challenge currently, okay? Even for people like me, I can only give you some good suggestions, maybe not the best, finally, you find like that. So I call this, or we call this some, call it like, we call this problem like a divergent uh, trajectories. Basically, different community build their own solutions. And then actually, when from application domain scientist perspective, how to select one solution to solve, help them solve their problems, still unknown problem or, or, or still are big challenges, especially if you want to get the scalability performance on top of this HEC systems, like high end computing system, that's very complex. I will show you how complex it is. Okay, anyway. Whatever the application I show over here is very domain specific, right? Sometimes some of you, if you're not working on that domain, you probably don't understand what I'm saying here <laughs> or don't understand much about the, the background and the, the key problems over there. But uh, let me give a simple example, right? I believe this example, I believe as long as you know a little bit about the computer science, you probably can understand it like sorting, right? So for instance, I give you a lot of integers. They say uh, like a scores, right? Or or like uh, salaries in, in uh, big companies or, or uh, some other numbers, revenues. You can, you can think any kind of numbers you have in your mind, right? So now the question is if your boss or if your uh, admin tell you that, or the president tell you that, okay, can, you, can you like tell me who has the high, which uh, group of people has highest salary in my company and what kind of KPI or, what kind of uh, revenue or what kind of other numbers they can generate or they can benefit of the company, how you can get that num number. Okay, I believe for some of, some of you, if you're familiar with Windows, right? You open Excel and then load data and then do a sort and then you get, the, you get the, some of these numbers. But unfortunately, right? That's not scalable, right? Because you can only do that when you have like less than several gigabytes of data or the integers. If your integers go beyond the, like let's say uh, terabytes, I don't think your laptop or computer can handle it easily, right? So then that's actually is a very big or st a classic big data problems. I have been teaching this one in my course uh, over the last few years. So basically you can think if you have a lot of, in if you have this like integer files, if you have a lot of these files and each file is very huge, then how you are able to get the final results like this, like a final output easily and quickly. So there is a program model called MapReduce. Basically, you can think it's like a divide, divide, divide and conquer model. I divide this uh, big problem to smaller ones and then I'm trying to sort it individually. 
And then finally, I do a shuffle and sort aggregation, and then reduce. I'm trying to like a, a sort them again so that I get a final output. So this is the broad idea of MapReduce. Very simple. I can summarize them in, in this just one slide and then a few words, right? But now th there's a, you will say, okay, it's so simple, right? Any challenges of, of this current model? Why you think this sorting is a big problem? Now this leads to some possible challenges you probably can understand, okay? If you, even if you don't have a CS background. So you can think if here, I want to, I just show three maps and the one reducer, right? You can get it find out the put sorted, find out put easily. But the question is, if you have more than one reducer, what happens? And this sometimes is, is, is a norm, right? You want, to, you want to scale your solutions. You definitely want more reducers to use your computing nodes and the, and, the, and the processors in a faster manner, right? But how to fix it, how to, how to use those things? Because you also want to get a total ordered sequence, right? You don't want to, okay, some reducers give you partially ordered, some other reducers give you another partially ordered sequence. You want them totally ordered, so how to solve it, right? And also if there are repeated integers in the original files, how you can filter out, or you can keep the, keep the consistent ordering in your final results. And if some failure happens, you know, failure happens every minute in your computer, right? Or in your, in your data centers. Then how, whether you want to redo it again, or you hope that the system can help, help you handle it automatically. And also when data science grows, like I said, for instance, if the data cannot fit in the space of a local memory, local storage, rack level storage, cluster level storage, what happens, right? And how to optimize these steps on modern data, center modern data center clusters and architectures. I will show them later. And then if you think of performance, cost, energy efficiency, for all these kind of perspectives, you can see that actually even for a single sort of problems, it's so complicated. As long as you can keep, as long as you think you keep growing your data size. Okay, terabytes, petabytes, or exabytes. How you can sort one exabyte integers in, in, in one minute. Right, that's a, that's a very uh, important problem also. And so different applications have different channels. This is only some example I showed earlier, but, it, but how to have a solution which can help all the application developers to solve their issues easily, uniformly. So uh, hopefully uh, this some kind of background and also challenge, hopefully uh, up here you already understand uh, big data better and why we want to write or want to do research on this domain and right? hyper big data computing. So any questions before I move on? Okay, so uh, anyway, so we can uh, just continue. Uh, let me also give a little bit of background on the trends, uh, like uh, in the community, what's going on, right? What kind of like uh, research, research, uh, active research is uh, being done in the community or, or uh, uh, proposed by different uh, places or teams? So one trend we see that there is an increasing use of HPC, big data, deep learning, and the cloud computing technologies, and also they are trying to confer, confer in a way that they can borrow ideas from each other and then trying to come up a, a, a better solution. Okay, many of these workloads actually can not only run on HPC infrastructures, but also cloud infrastructures. But now, if you look into the uh, other perspective first, like in the HPC and the cloud uh, clusters, I, I think some of you know that uh, in, in user Mercedes, we also have like HPC uh, computing center, right? So we, we act, in my team actually keep, uh, closely work with them and we have accounts and the UA actually is here. So we actually uh, get a lot of help from her to, to run our jobs on, on Pinnacles and, uh, and the Mercedes clusters. But if you look at those clusters, you can see that uh, 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 there are a lot of interesting or uh, advanced technologies available, like multiple, many core technologies, RDMA-based high-performance networks, InfiniBand and Rocky, and then NSSDs, PMAN, accelerators, like GPU, FPGAs, DPUs, uh, all the things you can find. Actually, I want to highlight one thing here, Frontier. Uh, Frontier, this, this supercomputer now is the number one supercomputer in the world. It achieves 1.2 exaflops per second. Uh, this is the first uh, exaflop machine developed by US. So this is the fastest supercomputer in the world. They actually, it, it actually uses all kinds of technology at least over here. And then uh, in networking technologies, you can see that uh, actually, uh, like I said earlier, we our group uh, work on this area in many, many, many years. So we have been trying to develop new solutions on top of RDMA-based uh, uh, high-performance networks, infinity band, 
rocky, those kind of things. It can deliver very ex excellent performance, like one, less than one microsecond latency, you are able to move data from one node to the other. You can achieve 400 Gbps per, per second bandwidth today with less than 5% or 3% CPU utilization. And it has influenced the uh, redesigns of many HPC middleware like MPIP, GAS, or parallel file systems. It has been used more than 20 years in the HPC area. So here I want to give you a high level overview of all these entanglements of protocols in HPC and descent clusters. So you can see that the left side is TCP-based based solutions like sockets, and many of you already heard of these things in the uh, undergraduate studies, I believe. But actually, uh, in the research domain, this year, especially in my team, we have been working on the, the red box over here uh, with, with many solutions we proposed. I will try to show that later. But I want to just briefly introduce what is RDMA so that you can, you can, you can understand uh, what I'm going to share later. Okay, RDMA is, a, is kind of like a called remote DMA. I believe uh, some of you, if you're familiar with uh, uh, computer architecture, course you, you learn in, in, in uh, CS uh, department, right? You probably heard of DMA, right? DMA is, for instance, you want to, you want to print any paper, uh, you don't want to wait printers finish and then release your CPUs, right? Then in that case, your printer is so slow. When you, if you print uh, like 100 page papers, you need to wait maybe half hours, then your CPU is kind of always occupied by that printing jobs that you cannot do anything else. So DMA is able to help you to release CPU cycles when the printer is printing, right? So you can do, you can still do internet uh, uh, search. You can still work on your paper, uh, your your PowerPoint, something like that. So DMA RDMA is a little bit different than that. RDMA is trying to extend. It, it's it's borrowed idea from there, but it's trying to extend it to remote node. So basically, you can think that in order to move data from one node to the other, in order to like uh, involve the both sides the RDMA is able to directly move your data from one node memory to the other node's memory without the involvement of remote side CPUs. You can see over these processes, right? The remote side CPU is totally idle. It can be used, the remote side CPU can directly, uh, uh, can, can not only uh, do some other useful work, it can also like just uh, dedicate this process to uh, purely to the, to the, to the Infinite Band Network or RDMA enabled network. Even for the initial side, you can see that you, you just, act, if you see the beginning, right, just actually, actually it's also very uh, less CPU utilization. You can just uh, post this request to the NIC and the network can finish everything automatically for you. Okay, so that's why I said earlier, you can achieve a low latency, high bandwidth and a very less CPU utilization. So with these things, you can think how we can uh, uh, re redesign our, our system or our big data applications, right? because originally many of them actually designed with TCP IP or socket based protocols. I will show some real examples later. So with this, with these te techniques, uh, uh, people also try to use them in GPU based clusters. So this actually is one is an ex example to show today, if you want to do deep learning training on more than dense GPU systems, what kind of complexity you may see uh, in the computer architecture perspective. You can see that a lot of GPU they connected with NVLink, another type of uh, interconnect, interconnect te technique, and then NV switch, and then across nodes you can use InfiniBand or Slingshot kind of new network to get it, to make them get it connected. But all this complexity, right? We don't want to like uh, ex get exposed to the applications because application developers they may not I guess, have expertise to fully utilize this technology fully. Uh, or efficiently, right? So as a system researchers like our group, we hope that we are able to help those people. And then we are able to help them to achieve the uh, performance and scalability automatically and transparently. Similarly for a story hierarchy, you can see that today I know typically you program with DRAM, right? But actually it's more than that. I mean, you can see from this hierarchy, you can play, you can program, you can put your data in DRAM, you can put your data in PMAN, you can also put your data in SSD or SD or uh, disks. Uh, all these thing, all these devices can be thing as a stored device today. And they actually for each of these devices, you can use different APIs or interface to interact with them. One example, like a uh, NVMe SSD, you can uh, today if you want to move data from one SSD to the other, you can use NVMe over Fabric. Sometimes also like a NVMe over RDMA or NVMe over TCP/IP, you can move your data from one node to the other. And sometimes you, you, you can you can also even 
uh, don't interrupt with your CPU anymore, okay? So that your data can be automatically moved from different nodes. But all these details has to be well-designed from your system software perspective. So for instance, if you want to use these features or these features I mentioned over here, you have to uh, carefully design your distributed source systems, network touch systems like NAS. But uh, like I said, uh, if you think about fault tolerance, scalability, cost efficiency, something like that, still a lot of work to be, should, be, should be done, okay? And then from software perspective, domain like uh, perspective, like I said, uh, many people actually try to use very complex uh, software uh, uh, system like middleware sometimes called. So one of them, one of the examples is called Spark. So Spark is, like I said earlier, is a, is a developed by UC Berkeley uh, team, and then is able to provide an in-memory data processing solution for different uh, applications like iterative applications, uh, batch processing, streaming, database, uh, deep learning, all the things. But uh, like I said, this just give you a very high level APIs, but how to utilize those uh, features I mentioned earlier and also how to deliver the desired performance and the scalability for tolerance kind of things, still a big challenge for, for not only uh, Spark designer, also for the community. And then similarly, many of you actually may use deep learning systems. Uh, this, this problem also uh, uh, exists for deep learning systems like uh, Google TensorFlow, PyTorch, uh, those, those kind of systems developed by those giant companies like Google, and Facebook. Okay, <clears throat> so let's make a summary for the challenge part. You can see that uh, this is actually the this is like the software hierarchy from uh, like you can think like bottom up or uh, from top down approaches, right? Your application running on top layer, and then and then you re rely on some big middleware like Hadoop, Spark, TensorFlow, or some other memory cache database kind of middlewares. And then you have to rely on some kind of prime models. The most common ones call sockets or some other things to move your data, manage your data. And then you have to develop some efficient communication IO libraries to handle pointable communication, collect, collective communication, synchronizations among processes, tasks, and threads, and how to handle IO file systems, how to handle fault tolerance, QS, and the performance analysis tuning. In the most importantly, you hope we hope that your solution can take advantage of the old technologies delivered by the hardware vendors, as I mentioned earlier, right? So now the question is whether, whether we, how to design these computing libraries, what should be right program models and how to make upper level changes for the code designs so that the, the, the funders uh, performance benefit can be achieved in end applications. That's a big challenge in this whole domain. Basically how to deliver the benefit across these layers and reach to the end applications. So most specifically, you can think there are multiple uh, questions we want to solve, or we hope to solve uh, in the community. Like uh, we, are, we want to understand what are bottlenecks and how we can solve those bottlenecks with the technologies I mentioned earlier. For instance, for interconnects, how we can use uh, our DMA based interconnects to help them move data faster. How can we use high performance storage systems to redesign their IO subsystem? And how to, uh, you know, with this design, how we can benefit the end applications? And also how to benchmarking them, how to analyze their performance, their something like that. Okay, so this is uh, like a channel, you can think it is like opportunities and trends. I will just give a quick overview about the recent up research avenues I, uh, with my, with my ex experience in the past, as well as I will try to show that what kind of impact I made and also what kind of uh, research works have been proposed by the other companies or or research teams, okay? So uh, again, I want to use big data sorting example uh, to, show, to show this problem, uh, to make, help you to understand this problem better. Like I said, there's a sort benchmark, like, there's, a, there's a sort benchmark uh, official website. They are trying to like uh, solve the problem, like I mentioned earlier, how to sort one terabyte of data within one minute, how to solve uh, one terabyte of data or one exabyte, or one exabyte data with within several dollars, something like that. But like I said earlier, if you do like a very small data sorting, it's not a big problem at all. But then if your data sets keep growing, then this become real problems. Let me show one, two real solutions in, in, the, in, the, in the research community. Okay, this is from SE13. This was did by University of Utah. 
So they are trying to use MPI-based sort to load data from parallel file systems to some IO nodes, and then use thousands of cores to sort terabytes of data, okay? I remember they, at that time, they, in 2013, they used thousands of nodes, but they, they can only achieve one about three minutes, uh, terabytes per minute kind of speed. But today, I think uh, uh, they can, uh, the, the Fortis record is or is re can reduce this uh, time from minute to several seconds. And then actually, uh, when I was a, a research scientist in, in OSU, we also extend this solution, use MPI plus PCA solution. We are able to achieve similar kind of uh, performance, but uh, we can reduce the resource utilization. But if you look at this picture, right, it's so complicated, okay? Even just for do one single sort, pair sort, okay? You need to like uh, organize so many disks, organize so many processes among different tiers of, of nodes, and then move data across memory, disk, th those kind of things, all those things you have to handle it. So let me give you some kind of, uh, oh, okay. So that's the HPC solution. If you think I, I said earlier, right? So for same problem from the application perspective, you can choose different solutions from different trajectory. If you are HPC guy, you can choose NPM or NPM plus BIGAS. But if you are a big data person, you can choose to use some solutions from big data community. Uh, okay, so maybe let me quickly finish as, uh, as many as I can. So in big data community, community you, can, you can do it with Hadoop or Spark kind of solutions, but still it's very challenging. Um, so here we just want to show some performance numbers. You can see that if you, if you choose the right solution, you're able to reduce time by 7x. That's very good, right? But in the meantime, if you from a productivity perspective, you can see that uh, you have to write so many code to achieve it. Okay, well, like 1,000 lines of code compared to 100 lines of code. Also, it's not very easy to scale. So like I said, uh, these are, these are like a uh, uh, disparity, right? You want to achieve high productivity, also high efficiency, the, but the problem how to achieve it. Uh, our goal is that we want to achieve benefits for the end applications from performance, scalability, productivity, cost, for tolerance, different kind of angles. So in my uh, experience, so actually I did both, I did, I, 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 I did two different kinds of uh, work uh, which which uh, can represent two different uh, methodologies. One is called HPC centric, but adapt to the big data scenarios. This is the open source project called Data MPI. This is one of my PhD thesis work, and then the other one is called the data centric and adopt HPC technologies. We actually uh, have another project called HiBD. This was my one of my uh, postdoc work in OSU. So, uh, but the, the end goal is same, right? We want to bring a convergent trajectory for high performed data computing. So you can see that we have a lot of papers over here. We are trying to achieve like more than uh, several X speed up for different applications. Uh, so because of, because of uh, I run out of time, maybe I will just uh, uh, quickly show some numbers and then without talking too much about these details. Okay, this was the idea. So and, uh, you can see that we're able to just write 38 lines of code, we, but you, our solution will be scalable from one gigabyte to one petabyte. And if you see the numbers were much better than, than the state-of-the-art solution at that time. Okay, this was, like I said, right, this was my PhD work. So it's like a, almost 10 years back, okay? This, this solution, this benefit for different applications. And then we integrated the, with uh, Apache Hive. We just changed 100 lines of code. We are able to speed up all the TBCH queries on top of Hive automatically. So this is the, we use Amda second node to analyze why we are better because our design is more balanced to utilize our resources. And then the impact of this project is that we, a lot of, a lot of organizations are using it, uh, uh, but uh, I think these are all the numbers when uh, I, I counted earlier, okay. But I wanna say that, okay, this solution actually influenced many SOTA designs and the research papers. If you search on the Google, you can see that, okay, many people trying to use, follow, follow this methodology, right? Trying to use HPC technologies and then adapt to the beginner scenarios. And then the other methodology called data centric, but incorporating HPC technology. Basically, I want to say that we can keep those uh, interface or software libraries intact for big data guys, but we can incorporate HPC technology into their soft software stack so that there's no any uh, there's no any loss in from from application perspective. So the same figure show earlier, but we what we want to do is 
instead of using the socket over TCP IP UDP kind of solutions, we are trying to borrow the RDMA technology from HPC community so that we can redesign the whole stack. So th this is Spark with RDMA uh, I did earlier. So this example, I'll just show some numbers, okay? So this is a speed up higher better. So you can see that we can we can uh, we can achieve like a more than twenty percent speed up for some workloads. This is the uh, deep learning training. We choose some big models at that time, and then we can achieve like a more than uh, almost up to three x speed up for deep learning training with, within the same hardware. And then some other more papers from for different systems. I, I list over here, but uh, we cannot talk too much. So the impact of this work is that we actually this actually this is a much bigger project. We have been working on this one for many years. Actually, this book actually. I have a lot of examples for, for this project as well. This has been uh, downloaded more than 45,000 times from the world. The, uh, not only uh, our solutions, actually our solution impacted many companies or research teams. They are trying to took similar ideas, but propose their own design. This is similar things proposed by Manlox. They want to, try, they want to do RDMA designs for the Hadoop MapReduce. And then this is for HDFS. And then this is the RDMA for Spark from Manlux again. And then this is the MDME based SSD of RDMA for, uh, for the HDFS. Similarly, uh, they want to build something, uh, try to borrow the HPC technologies for big data solutions. And then this is Intel uh, solutions they are trying to build to do on top of offer at last. So as you can see that uh, uh, we are not only published papers, we make software available and also this, so these things will influence other researchers from publishing papers as well as publish their software products. Okay, so now let's just quickly uh, give an overview of the book. So in this book, uh, we call it high performance speaking computing. I think you probably understand what I said a little bit already. So uh, if you have more interest, you can read this book. So basically this book is trying to provide an in-depth overview of an emerging uh, field that brings, brings together high performance computing, big data processing and deep learning kind of, uh, uh, solutions together. This book was written by three authors. Professor D.K. Panda <coughs> is a professor in the this Distinguished Scholar at the CSE Department in Ohio State University. And then I'm the second author and then Dr. D.P.D. Shankar. Actually, she's in the uh, room also, but unfortunately I don't have enough time. Uh, so she's currently working at SAP in Germany. Uh, she was a uh, PhD, stu PhD student codified by me and uh, Professor D.K. Panda. Uh, so thanks a lot to her contribution as well. And uh, if you look at ta table of contents, <clears throat> uh, we have, uh, I only covered the, some of them in this talk, like the red one, the introduction, program models, and uh, architecture trends, opportunities, and the challenges, and uh, how to accelerate it with our DMA technique. But actually many other things I cannot discuss because of I don't have enough time. If you, have a if you have a chance to read the book, please feel free to let me know and then we can talk. And the story of a book, right? I think this was something I want to share with you, uh, especially if, if some of you want to write a paper. So this book take almost about four to five years. Uh, it's really a good, big amount of work, okay? Uh, I didn't expect that because uh, we usually publish a lot of papers every year, but uh, when you write a book, you know, you, you not only write, uh, survey paper, something like that. You have to read a lot of papers from different uh, background and uh, you have to summarize them. And uh, especially for this book, you know, this field is moving on so fast. And then every time you have to keep updating your materials. So you can see that uh, over these years, right? In first draft, actually, we get some review. Uh, even in the proposal, we get reviewed people saying that oh, you should uh, include this, include that. And then after we put a contract and then we get some comments again. And then for the first draft, how we finish it and then if you said, okay, some new things comes, you have to you have to keep keep surveying, keep adding something new. And then in the rebuttal and the second draft phase, you have to read the review again comes, you have to change something again. Okay, so that's why it takes so many years to finish. But uh, all of these all the things actually started with the, the tutorials uh, uh, Professor DK Panda and me delivered in SE. Supercomputing 17 and 18. Actually, we delivered the tutorials to many conferences more than 50 times. Okay. But uh, I want in the SEC, I don't remember 17 or 18. Um, Mari from Mari from the MIT process process press, they she talked with us and she felt that whatever we presented over there is 
it's very interesting. Maybe we can write a book. And then through, from that time, we are trying to think how to write a book and the proposal, write a proposal, put together a contract, first drafts, rebuttal, second draft, editor's help. And then finally, we finish everything. And uh, if you want to write a book, let me suggest that uh, you have to really familiar with LaTeX, especially the template provided by the uh, editors. You have to work, you use that and then put high resolution pictures, photos, blah, blah, blah. And also you have to pay attention to copyright and uh, all the things. But I just think of something uh, I list over here, but many other things, if you have interest, feel free to talk with me. But the most important thing is that done is better than perfect, okay? Even now today, I still feel some part of the book is not perfect, but it doesn't matter, okay? Um, you can always improve it. So there's no end, right? It's like an end of this work. Uh, but anyway, I want to borrow one sentence from my daughter. When I told her that, okay, I have this book, uh, and then she, she asked me how many pages, I said only about, I said about 300 pages. And then she said, okay, only about 300 pages? You wrote it for five years? <laughs> so, I mean, uh, in, in the other hand, right, it's very short. So 300 pages is really small, right? You're very short for English books. Uh, so if you want to read it, feel free to do it. Okay, let me conclude my talk. Overall, I just want to tell you that the trend of, the, uh, of this uh, convergence is happening in the community, in different communities. And then what we are trying to do, or what, what my research is trying to do is trying to propose different solutions to, to make this convergent uh, trajectory happen so that we can achieve high performance speed computing uh, quickly or easier at least. Uh, we have been, I've been, my team has been working, uh, and myself has been, have been working on this area for uh, more than 10 years. Please feel free to read the book for more details. And uh, if you want, I still have some copies in my office. If you want to get one, feel free to reach out to me. And then looking for possible collaborations, uh, actually based on this, some materials of this book, I already created two courses at the One is for undergrad studies, one is for graduate studies. Acknowledgements, this is very important. I want to spend a few minutes on that. So I think some of, all of them already introduced themselves, especially my PhD students and the master students. These are current students, but actually for this book, right, most of the materials actually contributed by my past students, including uh, Deepti. Uh, she uh, spent a lot of time with me and the DK to work on this book. And uh, these are students in Panacea Lab, and then these are students I worked with earlier for, for, for in the OSU. So uh, all their work actually uh, inc in included in the book to some extent. And then research support, uh, I, we, without uh, so many funding support over the years from NSF, we cannot finish it. And also without support of, from university like UC Merced and Ohio State, I cannot finish it as well. And then I also want to thank some industry partners like Google, Facebook, uh, Nvidia, Manalox, and other collaborators. So very thanks. MIT Press, of course, I have been, we have been working with these editors so many times. Okay, they have been very helpful, okay. And then my PhD advisor, my postdoc advisor, they also, uh, whatever I learned actually from them. And uh, my dear families, parents, parents in law, wife, and uh, my kids, uh, they are very lovely. Uh. Okay, thank you. Sorry for uh, a little bit uh, over the time budget. Uh, hopefully uh, you enjoyed my talk and uh, feel free to ask any questions if you have. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, I'm seeing it looks like Haipeng, you have a question. I do. Uh, I know we're over time, but uh, I just asked this quick question. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Liu, for yes. uh, a very fascinating presentation. Uh, I have to admit that a lot of it uh, at the detail level that I don't understand. Uh, uh, <laughs> but um, but um, when we're talking about big data and particularly in your work, um, and nowadays, you uh, you almost cannot talk about big data about mentioning uh, uh, data security, right? Mm -hmm. so, uh, that's a that's a very uh, uh, becoming a very important and more and more important issue. Mm -hmm. I just wonder, you know, in the list of challenges, you didn't list uh, security as one of those challenges. So I wonder, is data security a um, a challenge in your work in the area of your work at all? Yes, yes, of course. Uh, that's a that's actually a very big challenge. Okay, 
uh, I didn't, uh, uh, my own, from my own research experience, uh, my team and uh, myself didn't do too much on that direction, but, uh, but the many other teams, they have done a lot of work over there. Okay, that's definitely a very, very big challenge. What, but, but recently, uh, I think some of my work will start exploring that direction as well. For instance, uh, for instance, for the bands, uh, the example I showed the FRMI data, we are trying to like uh, move data from hospital to cloud or from HPC, right? But the, all those data actually is patient uh, private data. It's very important. We cannot lose anything or leak anything to the to the public. So we are still discussing. That's a big challenge. That's a very big problem. So 